Welcome everybody. Um, I'm Rowley Sussex, Emeritus from the University of Queensland. And we have today a special edition of Data Science in the News, which is a QUT series of webinars which have been running every month uh, and has covered an enormous amount of fascinating ground uh, earlier this year. Today's session is done in collaboration with the Queensland Academy of Arts and Sciences, and it's got a special title, Data Science in the, sorry, uh, Future Trends to 2030 and beyond. Before we begin, Mark Wenetong, who's a Gabby Gabby man and one of our panelists, would you like to do a welcome to country, please? Um, look, sure. I'm happy to do an acknowledgement of country. Um, my, as um, stated, my name's Dr. Mark Wenetong, my name's Gabby Gabby, and um, um, and I, I would like to acknowledge the lands that we're all on today, wherever we are, wherever we're listening or watching today um, as well, and um, our oldest past and present. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay, now today's theme fits very much with the Queensland Academy of Arts and Sciences mission, and I quote it now, it exists to promote excellence in the arts and sciences, to stimulate activity in those areas that lie on the intersection between disciplines, and to provide independent scholarship and advice for social and public policy. And in order to address that pretty wide remit, we've got four different specialists from really very widely spaced uh, experience. Um, Karen Spiller, past national chair of the Association of Heads of Independent Schools, educationist. Professor Tamara Davis from UQ, an astrophysicist and ARC laureate fellow. Dr. Mark Wenetong, Director of Research Knowledge Translation at the Lewitcher Institute, and Jim Thompson, uh, the CEO and Director at the Queensland Museum Network. We're going to be allowing the panelists between five and seven minutes at the start to present some key thoughts relating to their areas. And I thought we begin with Jim, over to you. Thanks, Rowley. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's, it's great to be here. Um, Good afternoon. Um, look, this is a really big subject and five minutes doesn't do it justice. So I'll, I'll keep my focus narrow. It's in terms of future trends to 2030 and beyond, where are museums going in the digital age? I, I wish it was that simple. There are so many impacts that are coming into museums at the moment and uh, so many different ways in which we can work. It really is an important topic for us uh, as an industry. Data, data science and digital transformation are on the mind of most museums. The real difficulty for us is knowing how far and how fast we can move. Museums are, by their nature, places of curiosity and experiences. They're also trusted places of information and learning, and many have a really important role in the public discourse and access to information about issues such as climate change and biodiversity loss, amongst many others. However, great engagement with the public is sometimes really at odds with access to great information, but they compete in terms of uh, being entertainers, but also being people that can provide trusted information. And many museums in some ways now seem a little old worldy, traditional and perhaps staying. They're respectable, but unadventurous if you look at it that way. Museums have for a long time been places where real objects represent the real stories. There was and still is a fascination in being able to see the real thing and touch the real thing or be close to the real thing. But now big data, new information, personalised experiences and digital transformation are really becoming the norm and they accelerated during the COVID lockdowns. And they've turned the concept of a traditional museum a little bit on its head. And, and this drive towards digital enhancement and personalised access to information is greatly impacting both museums and how they operate and the exhibitions they put on. During COVID, there was a real marked shift to digital access to museums, the collections in the museums and providing online information. It was the museum at home. That's how we sold ourselves during that period of time. This was really necessary as most museums were closed to the public for extended periods. In some ways, it was a period of great innovation and the general view was that it would be a permanent change and improvement to the way museums did business. However, it was fueled at the time generally by funds and people redirected from other areas and was not funded in the long term. So for many museums, when people started coming back this year, um, well, late last year and this year, um, and looking for engaging experiences, a lot of museums reverted back to the real objects and their stories once again taking centre stage. 
However, the digital revolution hadn't stalled. It obviously hasn't stalled. We simply couldn't keep up with uh, both in terms of expertise and funding. Museums have now got to find their own balance, and this has become a real challenge. There is no doubt that the digital offerings and the information derived largely from new and sorry from large and newly accessible databases uh, can greatly assist the creation of new experiences. But of course, fantastic objects are still fantastic objects, and that's what people want to see. But really, we've found that now museums are not all equal. So where to from here? It really comes down to scale, skill, and skills and funding. Small volunteer museums versus large national and international museums are very different beasts. Those in the traditional world may stay there and there is a place for them. But we have now an emergence of totally digital museums and totally digital exhibitions and experiences and the bar has really been raised. There are now many touring exhibitions that are marketed as unique immersive experiences. They attract large crowds, a different crowd, many of those geared to those born in the digital era. Traditional museums must and will change. By 2030, many will be providing strongly digital, tailored individual experiences where you can make the decision on what information you would need. But I can't help but think that many old museums with objects of curiosity and places of historical significance will hang on. The real experience will still have its place. But access to big data, personalised information and AI is here to stay. If we can mix it with a heavy dose of entertainment, ethical considerations and public good, it will make for a, a fascinating uh, decade as we ponder the museum of the future. I'll leave it at that, Rolly. Thanks, Jim. That's a great start. Um, museums are the, 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 the public facing bit of science, if you like, uh, and the place where we often have the most direct contact with it, like the Exploratorium in San Francisco. Um, and I, I've been fascinated by the way in which museums present different faces to us uh, as you go to different places. Let's move on now uh, to Karen and education, which is another aspect of the public facing things in front of the public. Go for it. Thank you, Rolly. Hi, everyone. It's lovely to see you on board. Um, I'm going to be discussing data, data science and its influence on education, oh education policy. And I'm going to particularly address three major points. Uh, the first is teachers and teaching generally with a reference to NAPLAN, since that NAPLAN data has been released this year, oh, sorry, this week for this year. Uh, then the influence on teacher preparation and then school reform in general. So let's start with teachers and teaching. Well, certainly over the last 20 years, we've seen the datafication of education. The nature of teachers' work has changed and has changed by data. Teachers must collect it more, analyse it and respond to it. Just about every school would have data walls evident all around the school, whether they be in classrooms or staff rooms. And these data walls show students' individual progress, group progress against standardised norms. Now, this can be a very good thing to target individual progress. In the mid-2000s, Australia introduced the National Assessment Program in Literacy and Numeracy, otherwise known as NAPLAN, and this involves standardised tests in literacy and numeracy for students in years 3, 5, 7 and 9. The data is publicly available on the My School website and the media has often used it to create lead tables. This data drives school timetables, when subjects are taught, how long they're taught for, the allocation of teaching time, subject allocation, and even the allocation of teachers, with a focus often on the best teachers going on to certain year levels. And for parents, there's been a significant increase in the information that they have been able to access about school performance in that plan, and this has significantly influenced schools of choice. For teachers, the data can provide evidence of individual student growth, although longitudinal data can also reflect teacher quality and can be used by administrators. The release of the 2023 NAPLAN data just this week has led to a plethora of media reports you've probably been reading. The data demonstrates significant inequality and disadvantage on the rise in Australian society. Not surprisingly, seeing a difference between rich and poor, Indigenous, non-Indigenous, metropolitan and regional areas, and welfare dependent homes, with a third of students failing to meet the new national minimum standards. We also saw the release of the intergenerational report just yesterday, 
and the confluence of these two pieces of significant data and information have led to the Education Minister already pledging additional funds to prioritise disadvantaged schools to address this intergenerational disadvantage and to lift kids from poverty. So very significant influence of the data that is developed through schools and from NAPLAN. This data also informs education policy, particularly with regards to teacher preparation and preparedness. And this is intrinsically linked to my first point. On the 14th of August, a report from the Centre for Independent Studies um, noted that Australian teachers are less prepared for the classroom than OEC average and less ready to teach than graduates in similar countries, such as Great Britain and the United States. We also see in Australia significantly higher dropout rates from education degrees, and Australian teachers report feeling less prepared than they were in 2013. The Federal Education Minister, Jason Clare, cites this data from parents, teachers and students in feedback on schools, and the Scott Report, also recently released, noted major reform on how we need to train our teachers post-2025. Part of this reflects the April OECD Education Report, referring to the serious need for educational reform in all aspects of the Australian education system. The steady decline in PISA scores, which is an international testing rate, since 2000 in reading, maths and science is added to by a concern about social inclusiveness in schools with poor equity concerns in literacy and numeracy outcomes and declining school completion rates for some certain populations and in some geographic locations. This all has led to the National Teacher Workforce Action Plan, an example of this plan of educational reforms that have come out of this data. And this is very significantly tied to funding. Aspects of the National Teacher Workforce Action Plan include desire to include teacher supply, strengthen initial teacher education and aim to retain teachers. Quality Teacher Rounds is one of the funding mechanisms that we're seeing in schools, often across schools and sectors. And this is where groups of four teachers observe each other and analyze each other's progress and teaching practice. Again, in my view, a very positive direction, but directly tied back to the data that we're seeing about teacher and teacher preparedness. Finally, recent QUT data science research highlights the difference about preschool attendance rates and the attendance of children in preschool and the effect on developmental vulnerabilities. A study showed that children who attended preschool displayed lower levels of developmental vulnerabilities. The results differed by region, social demographic variables, including country of birth, English as a primary language, remoteness, and socioeconomic disadvantage. The results have significant ramifications for engaging education and healthcare professionals with families to target these particular areas. This is of particular concern in Queensland, where our overall preschool particip participation rates are the lowest amongst Australian states. And of course, this too varies geographically. So in summary, Data, collection, analysis and use significantly drives educational policy and practice at the federal level and in each and every classroom in Australia. While it can create unintended consequences like the lead tables, the use of individual student data, group data and other metrics has the ability to make a positive difference to the education of young people, the training of our teachers and the intervention to assist with disadvantage if our policy makers truly take note of it. Thanks, Rolly. Thanks, Karen. You've made my day with the datification of education. Another area where uh, we as ordinary members of the populace uh, felt at some, we used to feel at some distance from, from the real world where things were happening is in medicine. And Dr. Mark Winneton has a, a very interesting profile moving from uh, indigenous health, health policy, health in, information, uh, data sovereignty and other issues. Mark, over to you. Um, thank you and um, wonderful to be here as well. Um, Look, um, I'm I'm going to try and cover on as with everybody else. Data is massive in health, um, and um, and and emerging and and looking more and more exciting all the time, as well as looking exciting. I think it looks frightening, um, as well. So we've got to take the good with the bad and and try and work through where we're going. But I guess that's part of my talk. Is we're I'm currently involved in a 
um, evaluation of the National Indigenous Health Program. But um, trying to get data that is consistent across the states and territories, um, as well as the federal government, to be able to compare states and territories, et cetera, and population level data is almost impossible. It's just um, at some stage, I think um, we really need a, a very much big data national strategy um, that's not just about health, but that's where everything else fits in. And, and that's informed by industry as well. So it's not just about um, centrally determined kind of policy, what's important in Canberra, but um, what's important to people um, and what kind of data we should be collecting. Because at the moment, we kind of collect everything um, and then I'm not sure what we're looking for later on. Um, so some kind of program logic around that, both at um, national and um, state levels, but at interdisciplinary levels as well. Um, the other thing is 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 this whole issue of um, collecting a lot of population data now, that which we are because we're such a connected um, country. Um, um, how much is individual and how much is population and what are the ethics involved in this? And I still think, and, and including with AI, I think we've still got a little way to go on thinking through um, some of the ethics of these issues. Um, <clears throat> given that as well, um, um, you know, there's there's reasonable amount of crime now involved in um, health information and health data um, as well. And um, so security around that is is major um, as well as as information sharing. Um, um, and that kind of leads me to the next bit, which is kind of sovereign. We, we call it data sovereignty in a kind of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander terms, but really it's it's ownership and governance of data. And um, so do, do people really know who owns their data? Um, and this particularly around health data. You know, we started the e-health program and my my health record, um, et cetera. Lots of people were a bit scared by that though, even though it was only being shared with them really um, um, online. But we've still got a long way to go in, in our populace understanding a lot of the benefits um, as well as the limitations um, of these. From an <clears throat> Indigenous and First Nations perspective, of course, um, um, the data sovereignty is really about um, helping to understand the narrative and controlling that narrative a bit better. Um, as often, um, we just get talked about in a deficit kind of approach. Um, um, and the last thing I wanted to, to, to talk about was just that basically, and I think this is what kind of COVID brought up for us, that while we've got a lot of technological and data advances in Australia, we still have one of the remotest countries in the world. Um, so during COVID, um, of course, while we could use a lot of online systems and um, education resources and data, um, there's still plenty of places in Australia where we had to go back to radios and posters. Um, so even in, in a new age of data, um, um, access to data and access to online um, can still bring about inequities. And to be honest, in a country like Australia, it should be the opposite. Um, we really should be setting up the data and infrastructure for the remote and rural because that's who needs it the most because we don't have workforce, et cetera, out there. Um, but it, currently it's kind of, um, you know, probably the opposite of that. Um, and the last thing is around um, AI and um, it's it's certainly making a big splash in medicine and um, everything from detection of early sepsis in intensive care patients right through to um um, some of the um, text, uh, you know, being able to extract uh, medical information from free text in um, electronic medical records, et cetera. There's an there's a, um, uh, um, artificial intelligence that will do most things these days. It's where we, um, in, and it's once again working out the ethics of that in medicine, um, uh, as well as um, how far that can go um, safely. Um, but that's about it from me. Thank you, Mark. This is an enormously complicated area because uh, whereas in, in Karen's case, we have a, if you like, a great, a great big structured heap that people are starting to explore. In your case, uh, we're, we're somewhat, I think, further back in the field and trying to in, imagine how we could get data which would equitably serve the different people in different parts of Australia. And uh, thinking that you know, in, in remote areas, you're back to radio and posters, takes us rather a long way from where data science would like us to be, I think. From that to the enormous the big spaces of the uh, the world that Tamara works in, astrophysics. Tamara, it's yours. Thanks very much. Um, I actually have some slides, so I'll share my screen. Um, and I was going to take you on a little bit of a lightning tour around some of the data that we're dealing with in astrophysics, a completely different type of data to the kind of things that we've been talking about so far. 
So hopefully some of you have seen this beautiful image from the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and it's sort of a great demonstration of just how far we can look in the um, universe today, because with images like this, the light has taken so long to reach us that we're looking so far back in time that we're almost at the stage where we're seeing the universe as it was before the first stars even formed in the distance back there. Um, and we're looking at the universe in amazingly different ways from all the different wavelengths of light to cosmic rays like charged particles and neutrinos that are hitting us to another one that I'm really excited about at the moment, which is gravitational waves. So we're measuring ripples in space itself. And I'm going to start as deputy director of OSGRAV next year in the rebid of, of that, which is um, really exciting. Um, so I was going to tell you about two surveys that I'm working on right now and a little bit of just, just about the scope of what data can do at the moment. So one of them is the dark energy survey, and this is an image of the camera that we're using on a telescope over in Chile. This is the lens for the telescope. Uh, and with this, we've done, we did a survey of the sky that this camera can see something that's about sort of four times the width of the full moon on the sky. So you can observe really massive patches of the sky at once. And we have surveyed about an eighth of the sky um, to sort of resolutions that look just amazing when you look like zoom in on any little pa patch of this camera. Um, and one of the things that we did in Australia was we took these images found interesting objects and went to the Anglo-Australian telescope, which is what you're seeing here. And this is the a robot at the pointy end of the telescope positioning optical fibers at positions of interesting objects in that image. And this is gonna flip over, point at the mirror, and we're gonna capture the light from individual galaxies into individual optical fibers and get spectra of 400 things simultaneously. Uh, with that, we can measure their distances accurately and um, make maps this is just looking at the field of view where we put optical fibers on and make maps, 3D maps of things like this, where these sparkles that we're looking at um, are some of the uh, supernova that we found with our uh, survey. If you can see some sparkles in there, those are exploding stars um, that went off, which is um, uh, pretty amazing. If I have time, I'll tell you about the cool things that we're doing with the, the data of that um, at, the, at the very end. Um, so with DES though, with this survey, we start we observed for five years um, and a couple of years back we gave a data release, which you can go and download from the web. And that has over half a billion galaxies in it, in their, their positions in the universe are mapped. That's free for everybody around the world to download and use if you want. If you ever wanted to make a map of galaxies, here's a great, great option to do it. Um, but the quantity of data that we're getting is just um, phenomenal. I think we found 700,000 asteroids as well in, that are in our solar system. So while we're looking at galaxies, we're seeing lots of cool, cool foreground objects as well. But then there's other instruments like this one, which is the dark energy spectroscopic instrument, which is another one where this is the focal plane. This is like the, the bit that looks at the, the mirror of the telescope again. And what you're seeing here is each little tip on the end here is actually another optical fiber. But instead of having one robot to position 400 fibers, we now have 5,000 robots to position 5,000 fibers. So this is the new generation um, telescope. And we're involved in this project as well. And it similarly to the one I was just showing, you get images of the sky and then you select points that you want to get more data of. And then you set the spectrograph on that to get um, a spectra of all of those things at once. Uh, and so when I first started using that 2DF instrument, the, the first one that I showed, it took us five years to um, survey 250,000 galaxies in our first thing, and that was in um, uh, about the 20 about 2010. Um, and with this one, uh, we managed to get 100,000 objects in a night, um, which is both uh, depressing and very exciting. Um, considering how long it took us to get 250,000 in the first the first instance. Um, but with a couple of years of DESI, we've already mapped over um, 10 million galaxies. We're going faster than we thought that we were going to. Uh, and we've released a data release of our 1% survey. Um, and this is like an animation of the position, 3D positions of these sort of pencil beams that we've so far looked down. And what we're planning to do over the next few years is fill in all the gaps until we have a massive three-dimensional picture of where all the distribution of galaxies are in the universe. Um, and we've made a planetarium show about that. 
But anyway, to the sort of concluding remarks that I, I thought I would say is just talking about when we're thinking about the data that we have of the universe, there's a limit to how far we can see in the universe, um, limited by how far light can have traveled from the beginning of the universe till now. So we've got this sphere around us that's our observable universe. This is the map that we released with the um, uh, DESI survey. And each we are sitting at the center. Each dot is an individual galaxy. And you don't really get a sense of scale from this plot. So let me just explain uh, the scale on this plot. So if the light's traveling towards us from all different distances here, this the light that we're getting from these galaxies sort of nearby was emitted when the solar system formed, so four and a half billion years ago. Um, so it's been traveling for a long time. This is about half the age of the universe ago. This has been traveling since the universe was about three billion years old. So it's been traveling for more than twice the age of our sun, so uh, a long time. And the first stars formed about here. So there's not that much that we're missing now. And the next generation of surveys that we're doing are going to observe essentially every galaxy in the observable universe, um, which is a remarkable statement to be able to make. Um, so here's me getting very excited at one of those observatories. This is the Vera Rubin Observatory in Chile. Um, and I went and filmed an episode of Catalyst um, with some of it over here. This is like the massive imaging machine that's going to be the next successor to the Dark Energy Survey. Um, it'll, it can observe at one time 40 times the full moon, and it's going to make essentially a movie of the sky because it's going to look at the whole sky every three nights, so the whole uh, southern sky. So we can't – traditionally, we've, we've only had like still images because we take an image and then we don't go back for a long time. But now we're going to be really looking at the universe as a dynamic thing where we see sort of the, the slow motion movie of still frames every three nights. And over five years, this should make 500 petabytes of images, 7 trillion um, images of 37 billion sources. So this is really, I think the expression on my face in that one is remarkable, is, is appropriate for the remarkable data. Um, yeah, and that's just a small subset of the kinds of data that we're getting for astronomy right now. The vast majority of it is all public to the um, anyone who wants to, to use it because it's all about open data. And the thing that I haven't even touched on is the kind of data you can get from simulations. And this is a simulation of the structure formation in our universe where the tiniest dots that you can see would be galaxies. And this bit in the center is sort of the formation of a cluster of galaxies over time. Um, and as that um, finishes playing, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. I haven't told you any of the real science goals of why we're doing these massive um, surveys, but we're talking about data today and the, the scale of data that we have about the universe around us at the moment is um, spectacular. Thanks. Thanks, Tamara. That was astonishing. Um, the, the numbers the numbers are so enormous that it makes makes you wonder. You know, here here are we at a tiny corner of the universe. Uh, Galileo would have been when absolutely blo mind blown. Uh, you know, yeah. finding his own lenses for his own telescope. Uh, that was yeah. lovely stuff. Thanks. Okay, the we're, we're talking about vast amounts of data in different shapes and different qualities. Some of it is uh, very carefully curated. Uh, other other bits, as Mark was saying, are, are still in the process of invention to try and work out how you can go about even getting data together. So I think there's a very important bit of uh, question about the curation and collection. And then there's another question about how we actually present this to people outside our disciplines, because it's a very important issue uh, that if there is scientific information, that people who would like to know about it need to have some handles on, on where to go. I can imagine, for example, Tamara and Jim talking to each other about the museum doing something on astrophysics. But it's actually more, more deep, deep than that. It has to do with the way in which we bring the perceptions and understandings of our data into the wider world. Would anyone like to deal with this? Because it's actually part of interdisciplinarity, which is right at the heart of the mission of the Academy. Who'd like to start? Jim, go for it. Yeah, look, it's, it's a great uh, great way of uh, discussing this issue of, of bringing it forward. I think Tamara and I have already uh, spoken many times in the World Science Festival about, or Tamara has been part of the World Science Festival, so that we present that to try and uh, showcase the, the beauty of science and the 
the accessibility of science in, in different ways. And um, but it, it's and, and often space is the one where the numbers which we've just seen are, are absolutely staggering and, and they continue to be staggering. And people are fascinated by that. And, and I, I spoke a lot about exhibitions and how things are presented these days digitally. And the challenge for us is to be able to make those stories simple, as, as you said. They, they really need to be able to be broadcast to a much wider audience in a number of different ways. And that doesn't always come from the scientists themselves. So we see ourselves at the museum as having that role. But we have our own data problems. We've got 15 million objects in our museum collection and we rarely get to talk about those in a way in which we'd, we'd like to or show them in a way in which we'd like to. And we need to share that because, in a sense, we're part of the, a massive, uh, it's not citizen science in that sense, but it's, a, it's about sharing of our data with others who are collecting similar data. And that's about the distribution of, uh, of animals in Queensland and, and fauna in Queensland. So, look, there's some really great challenges in that area. Mm. Karen, with your data, um... Education, instead of being something on the other side of the ivory tower, is actually within reach now and concerned people, particularly parents, uh, but also policymakers and the general public, can get their hands on some of the, the things that are driving the thinking and discovery of new directions in education. Um, how do you go about presenting all of this in a way which people can understand and hopefully not misunderstand? Uh it's important, I think, to uh, present to parents the individual progress of their particular students. So now that we've had uh, NAPLAN across years three, five, seven and nine for a number of years, we can, in fact, with, with some differences uh, in every uh, NAPLAN test every year, but we can actually track students who completed NAPLAN um, seven years ago in year three or whatever and see their progress in terms of their literacy and numeracy development. And we can also see their progress towards these uh, minimum standards and to students from similar socio-demographic areas in Australia. And in fact, the My School data does present that information uh, quite well. Um, the challenge is to make sure that our parents and policymakers realise that this, this standardised test is not the be-all and end-all of education. Um, it's very helpful data. It's very helpful individual data. It's helpful group and longitudinal data. But, you know, practice practising teachers in the classroom need not to have always their time taken away by preparation for NAPLAN or analysing the data. We know we need that close interface with teacher and student and learner and so on. Um, so I think that's part of the challenge going forward, Rolly. Mm. Yeah, there's been a bit of uh, attention in the news recently to a couple of schools, I think an Adventist school in Sydney, that's, that's had some really great results uh, on a rather traditional sort of approach. Well, it's certainly been my experience that what I call good old fashioned teaching is um, is alive and well. Uh, the emphasis on literacy and numeracy, the spending time making sure that young people can read and write and enumerate. These are skills that will never fail us. We always must have this and we must always ensure that our teachers are, are trained in their early teacher education to be strong teachers of literacy and numeracy across the board. And we know there are some tried and true ways in which teaching um, works for kids. Um, but we all also must make sure that our teachers are human and they understand the challenges that our young people are facing. Um, so there's no one panacea. And there's no one audience either, because as scientists, we're all addressing different audiences in different ways at different times for different sorts of communication. Mark, you're, uh, you've been a, a, a physician in regional Australia. You've had a lot to do with policy. How do you envisage the, the data issues for different kind of consumers of information in the medical world? I wish it was as lovely as that last presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you could present health like that. In a, it's just exciting and, you know, um, and an awesome way to be able to look at things. And um, health is not so sexy. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and to be honest... Um, because, you know, look, you only had to look at um, what happened during COVID and different states and territories and, and um, medical officers were saying different numbers um, um, and with the feds, et cetera. And um, there, there's a lot of um, grey areas in what, what we're talking about in health data and health information. And um, 
and it can be kind of mis misinterpreted quite readily and, and quite easily. So um, really the hard part, I think, for us is, is to make sure we have an accurate representation of data. Um, and once again, you know, it, it you know you can put a million graphs out there that, that nobody understands, um, um, or you can say something you know that's very clear and concise. Um, and um, and the hard part is is uh, you, you're taking a very complicated system and trying to simplify it into some simple data that people will understand easily, um, and it's just not always that that simple. So. Um, so yeah, it's um, uh, but that's kind of what we do. We try and take complicated um, sets of data and make it simple enough so that people can understand um, without having a big medical background. You know um, um, what's going on and um, what risk is, for example. You know what's cardiovascular risk and how do you assess that? Um, those kind of things. So, um, so yeah, very different and um, and no one near as nice as that. I, I'm just I love the whole neutrinos, dark matter, the whole. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just find that all amazing. I'm sorry, I'll, but I'll try and get back to health at some stage, okay? <laughs> yeah, well, I was about to say, you know, I give you a little problem to to re reduce medicine to neutrinos and you'll be all right. Um, <laughs> Mark, we've got, I've got a question for you from a, a colleague at QUT. Um, what are your thoughts about engagement with government? And this is territory government, state government, federal government, to address the issues that you were discussing, including like the ethics and access to information. Yeah, look, um, lots I, I, of things that can go wrong. Yeah, um, that's kind of what we talk about a lot when we talk about data um, sovereignty, is um, being able to control that that information a bit better with proper analysis and proper contextual um, analysis, etc. So, um, um, so um, trying to ensure that a that. Um, a population level data doesn't go down to too too low a level because you know we have small communities um, and it's actually pretty easy to identify people when you're talking about small data in small communities so those kind of things but but as well as that um, trying to change things from just that kind of very deficit language of well you know this small communities had 17 you know suicides in the last two months kind of stuff um, so that it's not all about the negative side of things, but there's positive things as well, um, particularly around you know cultural determinants and other work that we've been doing, and um, positive strengths of communities and things like that. So trying to get some balance in the narrative and the use of data so that it's not all um, negative, um, and um, and um, that's that's been an ongoing issue with um, both levels of government, and um, but but most now are kind of. Um, come into the, the game plan partly because I, I guess they want to look a bit better as well and instead of having all these CTG reports that are looking terrible um, um, each year but um, but yeah um, it is an issue and it is it is trying to ensure that we get the right data presented and presented the right way that tells the right story that's accurate you know um, and um, and that's an ongoing issue. Right data presumably Tamara your data are usually right so long as you've done the work properly. But I've, I've, I've well, but go on. I, I've got another question about, about presentation of data for everybody. Um, you've, you've presented some visualizations which are, are quite astonishingly beautiful. How do you think about the notion of making your very complicated work accessible to a curious but not necessarily expert audience? Yeah, well, it's... I love the faith you have in my data. I also hope that I have done it correctly. Um, but there's always possibilities for stopping up somewhere, uh, which is why measuring things in many different ways can help you uh, avoid some of those uncertainties. Um, but the visualization of data is, uh, and the conveying of the, the both the excitement of gathering it and um, the the Im importance of it or the, the interest in it is really important for me. Um, and it's actually, so the big data, like, you know, with astronomy, we have these ginormous data sets sometimes. And if if I told someone to go and download this dark energy survey data where, and it was a table with 271 columns and um, 800 million rows, um, that, <laughs> that would be uh, difficult. And most people couldn't do that download actually. Um, and so we have to come like make ways for it to be easily accept accessible where people can search it without doing um, like downloading the whole thing and figuring it out themselves. So if you just want, just want the galaxies that are in this little range in this patch of the sky or something, people can go and do that. 
Um, and so we have a lot of postdocs and students who, are, who work on just that aspect of making the data accessible because we've learned a long time ago that if you make your data public and other people can use it, uh, you get more benefit, you get more like citations for your papers and stuff like that, but the data actually gets used and that's what everybody wants really. Um, but the the interesting thing, like during COVID, Sam Hinton, who made the the movie that was zooming around with Supernovae going in it, one of my postdocs, he um, switched during COVID for a few months to help um, some medical teams that were compiling data from different hospitals around the world about what were the effective cures or not. And he visualized, like like made dashboard visualization for them, and also did the bit of some of the da automatic data curation where sometimes you know people were putting different units on the dosages and things from different hospitals and stuff, which made it really complicated. Um, and so he, the, the skills that you use in astrophysics and stuff and the, the ways that we figure out to do the data are the kinds of things that they then go get applied in um, different fields. And that's one of the reasons that we do it. That's fascinating because I'm, I have a personal bet on visualization as being one of the areas where we might try and build a bridge. Um, you're talking, about your data as if they are a, sort of the democracy of scientific discovery. You no, know, it's there for everybody mm -hmm. if you can make the steps towards it to understand it. But are we talking about democracy and equal access for everybody, Jim? Um, we're trying to, I think, Rowley. I mean, the aim of the museum is very much about... Uh, access and uh, diversity of access and, and accessibility to, to information and to data. And I see a, a question there about how do we address these types of issues with people wanting new data. And increasingly, we need to be offering experiences where people can uh, delve into the data in their own way so that, that we don't just put up a presentation and say that is it. But with smartphones, with a whole range of technology these days, exhibitions can provide as much or as little information as people want. And I guess when I'm talking about the public here, as opposed to the scientific work that we do in or that's done with in museums and historical work, it really is about trying to get ways in which people can interrogate the data or have access to it. A lot of that might be online, of course, where people want to do that without coming uh, into the museum. So um, we need to be able to present those uh, that information in different ways. But of course, it also means we need to stay up to date. So you can put something in and a couple of years later, it's completely out of date. And you go to a lot of museums and see, and we're all guilty of this, you go to a lot of museums and see places where the information that's up there, everyone knows it's out of date. And they say, well, that's not relevant anymore. And that's a real risk for museums. Mm. I believe it was IBM that said that knowledge is doubling every 11, every 11 months at the moment, which, which is, is kind of impossible. Um, so we, we have additional obligations uh, as specialists in our field to, to, to present and to bring the data towards people so that they can start getting some kind of sensible, um, sensible understanding. But then there are issues of ethics. And of course, Karen, in, in your case, how fine grained are the data and could they actually be accessed in an improper way, in the way that Mark was talking about? Uh, it depends which data we're referring to. Um, a lot of the data is contained within a state and federal repository. So uh, I don't believe it's fine-grained enough to um, identify individual students unless uh, there is a disaggregation of some of those very small communities that Mark was referring to. Uh, so I think it's fairly common in that sense. What concerns me is the manner in which it's always used in that um, educational policy makers, unfortunately, use the data for their own um, ways and means uh, to demonstrate that whatever party they're not part of um, has clearly done a bad job of funding education or introducing educational practices rather than everybody getting on board and saying, OK, let's use this data to identify the trends seeing what's making a positive difference, seeing where the differences are and the disadvantages are and channeling money and resources into those particular places. In a country like Australia, there's no way we should be um, down the OECD rankings as significantly as we are. And yet it's per perfectly possible to imagine ways in which your data could be malevolently misused. With... Uh, it, it, it's already malevolently misused if you look about the leagues table, tables and you look in the way that some of the media will um, play off 
public schools, uh, play off independent schools, play off individuals that you've already saw. Um, so that level of um, unhelpful behaviour does not um, support any positive way in which our young people can go forward in their education. Because mm. you and Mark actually have a, a very interesting convergence of issues about, about people in rural and, re and remote communities because the, the schooling systems there are not, they're struggling in some cases. They're absolutely struggling. They're struggling to get quality teachers to keep them. They're struggling to get resources. There's a huge amount of disadvantage in terms of internet access that and Mark's already um, referred to that. And, you know, again, in a country like Australia, even though we are such a huge country, with our level of sophistication, our level of resource supporting, the GDP spending should be increased on education to make sure our rural and remote kids um, are supported, just as our kids on the eastern seaboard are. Mm. Yes, I, I recently paid a visit to Finland where they've taken the decision that the most important thing for the country is a well-educated young next generation and where teachers are among the best paid people in the country. And so the best people are competing for jobs in education, which is a That's rather... Rather nice idea. Look, the, the, that's a whole other webinar to have that conversation about how we attract uh, the brightest and best to education and then mm. how we... Yeah. Tamara, can, can your data be potentially misused or weaponized or something? Mm, it would be difficult uh, in the sense that, um, well, scientists can use it and get and drive uh, incorrect results, but it's unlikely that anyone's going to to weaponize dark energy or anything anytime soon. Although, to be honest, that is one of the things that you worry about when you're looking at new fundamental physics. You never know what the results are going to point you towards. And so that that is forever a concern. Um, but the 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 data can be, um, yeah, we we are concerned about people if you give people the raw data, they and they and someone doesn't understand the selection effects and things that it can came on incorrect uh inferences can be made so that's one of the the main worries um but one of the things we'd love to do is get people to use the data and especially the citizen science type of things where we feed people pictures of galaxies or pictures of things and get them to classify them or help out in some way and things that I, we find that's a really um rewarding and useful way to engage the public in some of our science because mm. it seems to me the way we're all talking uh, i think there's a new a uh, role emerging for people who are specialists and that is it's not popularization because that 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 actually almost cheapens it but as being interpreters in various ways of the sorts of things that we discover and and uh, at many different levels um, th there are people like Steven Pinker who's done uh, books that I very much admire on cognitive science and you know using language and so on but it seems that the uh, the the purely laboratory uh, scientists who never talk to the public at all is becoming a thing of the past. Um, Tamara, could you talk us, uh, tell us a little bit about your recent TV program, for example? Uh, yeah, I was very lucky enough that after being on Catalyst, the ABC science show on TV a couple of times, um, they asked me, hey, what do you think a good episode would be? And um, and so I gave, made a suggestion for an episode and gave them sort of a plan and then ended up filming that. And so now I've done five, five hour long documentaries on Catalyst where I've been the host and gone around and interviewed people and, that was um, time consuming, but very rewarding because you can get out the you know, some really interesting information and try and figure out how to um, convey that hard science in, in a really accessible way. So my last one about dark matter involved rollerblading, indoor skydiving, um, going down into a mine, um, uh, a whole bunch of fun stuff, uh, which is hopefully an engaging way to get people to understand why we are so sure that there's this weird dark matter and dark energy out there, uh, despite the fact that we can't see it directly. Yeah, you, you talked about understanding these in an accessible way, and Mark talked about understanding early. I think we have quite a lot of, lot of work to do because raw data can be very inscrutable and hard to get at. And there are people who really have a genuine, a genuine in, interest, but they don't know where to start finding a handle to pull. And uh, we, we need to come a long way towards the, the, the consumers in order to include them in our area of excitement. Uh, and I, your, your programs tomorrow were full of excitement about going down mines and things. They were great. 
Um, but the, the rest of us as well, I mean, it's actually quite difficult. And Jim is, is, is right in the middle of, of the, the interpreting role. Uh, but then how do you pitch your exhibitions? What sort of level do you decide to go for? Like you said, there's different levels, Rolly, and you have different exhibitions for different levels. I guess one of our aims is very much to try and help make a scientifically literate community. Um, that's an, an easy thing to say, a very hard thing to do. You know, we, we try and put, uh, put our programs there so that we really attract kids and the next scientists to come through. But, we, you know, that's a long way away. We want to make sure that we can utilise the people of today. And that's very much about the whole community understanding science. They don't have to have studied it. They don't have to be living it, but they just need to understand it. And I think we're seeing that a lot. Uh, and discussions about the data that's around at the moment. People are using it, and Karen mentioned this before, people are using this in different ways. You can use it for good and bad. And, um, you know, there's those stories in every piece of data if you want to look for them. And I think that's a real shame that people are uh, actively looking for those bad outcomes from uh, information that they don't, uh, don't really understand. Mm. And uh, I, I think we need courses somewhere on, on how to become a critical consumer of the stuff we find on the internet, because, say, during COVID, there, there was a, a disgraceful amount of misinformation, which is generally classified as mistaken, and disinformation, which is absolutely trying to mislead people deliberately. Uh, and it's very hard in your coming, if you're coming into an area from outside to work out <clears throat> how to be a... Um, creative and critical consumer of what you're encountering. Anyway, we're, we're in, getting towards the end of the program. Sorry, go, go for it. Someone wanted to intervene? No? Okay. In which case, I'd, I'd like to invite you all, if you'd like to speculate for a couple of minutes about where your discipline might be 2030 and beyond. Uh, I'm a linguist, and uh, with the uh, arrival of computer tools, I'm now able to address databases of billions of English words and to discover things going on in text which I never could have imagined in the past. How does the data science thing look as if it might affect your disciplines? Who would like to go first? Tamara, you're it. Um, okay, 2030 and beyond. We will have made maps of the vast majority of the galaxies in the universe. We'll be using artificial intelligence to classify galaxies to make better models of how it, how it's all working, things that we're already um, starting on. We may have, my speculation is we may have discovered um, hints that there's life on other planets with some of the um, data that's coming in right now about the atmospheres of um, other planets. Um, and we'll also be seeing every gravitational wave in the observable universe as well. Um, so we'll have a much better picture of our understanding of the of the universe around us, and that will be being translated into our understanding of fundamental physics and the way we use data here on Earth. So. Lovely. Who's next? Karen. On a, on a very different level and scale. I'm also taking a very positive and optimistic note that we're going to have the use of local and national data to truly improve student outcomes um, equitably across Australia, addressing um, the regional and other disadvantage and divides that I've referred to previously. We're going to see change in initial teacher education, and that will be supported partly by the university accord. We're going to see good practice supporting, um, you know, the young people in our classrooms so that each and every young child has the very best opportunity to, excuse me, to achieve educational outcomes, to give them the best pathway in life. And the data is going to be key to that. Our teacher's work is going to become apparent and visible for parents and will be um, appropriate supporters and colleagues in that pathway to great outcomes for young people. What a lovely view of Utopia. <laughs> That's me. Mark? Um, look, I guess um, just that um, as as this exciting new age of health information technology and AI increases, um, that we all have, all Australians have good access to that and um, in a way that benefits their lives and health. 
Yeah, and there was a report just yesterday about a company in Adelaide that's got together with uh, imaging and artificial intelligence and imaging and now making it possible to diagnose endometriosis without having to do surgery. That sort of thing is hmm. amazing. Is yeah. Jim, you had the first word. Would you like the last one? Uh, it's uh, an organisation that's 160 years old, Rory, uh, Rory sorry, in uh, 10 years' time. Uh, look, I think... Uh, Museums will still be here. Uh, that's very much my wish and hope. And ironically, I think the um, uh, the objects that are in museums that people want to go and see, whatever they may be, are still going to be a central attraction to a lot of people. But there will be accessibility to information, uh, both online and on site, in ways that we probably can't even imagine now. There'll be immersive experiences where you'll be able to bring up uh, information that comes from a whole range of different sources and is presented to you in a way in which you want it to be presented. So it's that individualised experience again. I think it's a really exciting time for uh, museums. I think it's a great time to um, have the types of innovation that we're seeing happening around the world being able to be presented uh, at a place and uh, to people that really want to be there. So I think it'll be a really exciting uh, period. We're a positive lot. That's rather nice. Um... Picking up your thought about the individual experience, um, there's a, a very interesting video uh, by Khan, the person who did the Khan Academy, um, saying that AI, in fact, offers each learner on the planet an individual tutor of very great expertise who can possibly guide them through learning in a way which has simply not been conceivable before. All of that's rather, rather intriguing if it's right. Uh, I'm, some a friend of mine tested chat GPT uh, about me and it said lovely things about what I'd done for language and said what a pity that I'd passed away in 2018. <laughs> I quoted them the next day. One of these webinars on AI I think in November. Uh, watch out for it because it'll be picking up some of the themes that we've been uh, talking to talking about today. So look, my very warm thanks to Jim, Karen, Mark and Tamara for an absolutely intriguing webinar. I've learned some things and I will go away with, with uh, some questions, which I will probably want to reflect on for quite some time. Thanks also to Becky and Tim, our technical staff. And uh, I've found this an, a new and exciting experience and I hope we'll be able to do it again sometime in future. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.